I know. What a great way to start this slide with a disgusting image of a disgusting organism. But to more formally introduce this wondrous monster in front of you, we are in Phylum platyhelminthes and looking at class Cestoda. And class Cestoda contains all of our tapeworms, like this microscopic image you see of one here. Now there's lots of different species of tapeworms, and they infect a lot of different organisms. But despite the variety and diversity within tapeworms, they all share two common characteristics. One characteristic is kind of this head region of the tapeworm, which is referred to as the scolex that you can see here. And the scolex looks quite different between species, but it all has the same function, really for attachment. Most tapeworms, but not all, will attach somewhere in the intestines of an organism. And at this attachment site is where this tapeworm is going to get all of its nutrients from. And it's getting it from its host organism. The pretty much majority of the rest of a tapeworm is created of individual units called proglottids. And inside of a proglottid is essentially testes and ovaries, the ability to create egg and sperm for self-fertilization. Each proglottid is an egg-making factory, with the most mature proglottids found at the very end of the tapeworm. So essentially the tapeworm makes proglottids from this head region. So the scolex is where it actually attaches to the intestine, for example. And then kind of the region you see here right behind the scolex is where new proglottids are being formed. And then the proglottids, if we were to trace this around, at the very end of the tapeworm is going to have eggs that are pretty much ready to be released into the environment and to hatch into the larval form. Now, that actual life cycle is really going to be dependent upon the species of tapeworm. So let's actually look at one of these life cycles. This is from the CDC website. And this is following um, two different tapeworms that act very similarly, uh, Tinea saginata and Tinea solium. You really don't need to know those species, but just know that they're kind of doing the same thing. So... This particular tapeworm that we're going to follow the life cycle for is a tapeworm found in humans. Not all tapeworms are human tapeworms. There's tapeworms in dogs, there's tapeworms in mollusks, there's tapeworms in birds. So tapeworms are kind of uh, not selective. They're, I shouldn't say that. Tapeworms can be found everywhere in the animal kingdom, but a specific species of tapeworm is very specific to the hosts it has. So with these two tapeworms, they have two hosts. One of their hosts is humans, and their other host uh, for Tinea saginata is cows, and Tinea solium is pigs. But they both follow the general life cycle, which is why they're together here. Now, it starts with one down here. I'm going to actually start with humans first, because this is probably the part of the life cycle you're most familiar with. And we're going to start with that adult tapeworm that's in the intestines. And I'm sure you have read or heard about tapeworms before. I have no doubt that there was an episode of House where it wasn't lupus and instead it was a tapeworm. So in humans, tapeworms will attach to our small intestine and their scolex attaches to the lining of our small intestine and will essentially take nutrients out of our food uh, and ingest it to help it with its own processes, namely making eggs. So you got the scolex, you know, hanging on to the intestinal wall, and then you got that whole long tail of proglottids with the most mature proglottids at the very end. Now this isn't our small intestine. This is on the way to becoming poop. So those really mature proglottids at the end of the tapeworm are going to release once they're mature enough, and they're going to follow through the rest of our small intestine, through our large intestine, and finally out in our feces. And this is what this is showing in one here. So the proglottids pop out, and then here's kind of what individual eggs look like within those proglottids. Now the next step specifically depends on the species, but either a cow or a pig eats those feces. And you know, cows 
feces is not part of their diet. But more realistically, you know, maybe you pooped when you went camping into the environment and there was a rainstorm. And so kind of the different things in your feces kind of washed away. So it's not just like chunks of poop. Uh, it's just like water that went over your poop onto a grassy field and the cow is eating that grass um, that was washed over from your feces as carrying those eggs in it. Now, when the pig or the cow eats those eggs, the cow and pig really aren't negatively impacted like humans are. What will happen is the egg will hatch, it develops into a larvae, the larvae is going to head its way into the muscles of cows and pigs. And here are the larvae, it doesn't say it here, but essentially they create almost like a cyst and they kind of go into a stasis. They kind of just chill there. They're waiting, they're essentially waiting to metamorphosize. They're waiting to be in the right conditions, in the right environment, at the right time to turn into an adult, to, to mature. They can't mature in the cow. They can't mature in the pigs. They really need that other host to do so. Now, the cow and the pig do not feel these cysts. These are very, very small, small cysts. You could look at a cow and have no idea that its muscle fibers have this. Now, you and I, we go to the store, we go to a farmer's market, we go to our friend's house, and we get a steak. And that steak happened to be from a cow that has these cysts in its muscle. And that's what steak is. That's what beef and bacon and all of that is. It's muscles. And we cook it. But if you don't cook it enough, if there were cysts in there and you undercook your meat, those cysts never die. Those larvae don't die. If you cook your meat hot enough, it's fine because that heat is essentially going to kill it. But if you undercook it, that's where the danger is. And this is actually why restaurants will not cook your meat uh, below a certain range, or at least some restaurants don't. Uh, sometimes they'll say uh, meat, the minimum is medium rare, or there might be a warning label saying undercooked meat can cause health issues. And this is why. Now, realistically, are you going to get a tapeworm from eating your steak rare? Honestly, it depends on where that cow came from. Is that cow being fed a diet from an organic farm um, that is super highly regulated? Is that, oh my God, is that pig, you know, eating from a field that human feces likely came from? Depending where you are in the world will really depend on what that answer is. So this is definitely not something that's been eradicated. This is something that's still a problem. But how big of a problem is really depends on where in the world you are and kind of how that meat was grown. So as I mentioned before, our class cestoda contains all sorts of tapeworms. This just happens to be looking at two different tapeworms um, that infect humans. But there are tapeworms that infect others. So keep that in mind. Next time you order a burger, go for at least medium rare just to be on the safe side. <laughs>